Welcome to Kingdom Reality, your gateway to deep insights into the truths and realities of God's kingdom. Dive deep into the teachings of esteemed teachers of God's Word as they illuminate the mysteries of Scripture, offering priceless wisdom and revelations. Our channel serves as a beacon of enlightenment, guiding seekers on a transformative journey towards understanding the essence of divine truth and purpose. Join us as we explore the depths of spiritual reality and embark on a quest for genuine understanding and spiritual growth, revealing kingdom realities. Dr. Mensa Odebill turns 50, and we're thinking about all the smart things he's learned in his life. From hugs with family to big wins, every moment teaches us something important. Life's like a big song. We're all different, but we're all singing together, even when things get tough. Life's a mix of good times and tough ones, but together, they make a beautiful picture. Let's remember the things Dr. Mensa Odebill's learned. They can light up our way to a better future. Lesson number seven. Choices really do have consequences. Choices really do have consequences. That is something we easily forget. Sometimes we think we can get away with it. I will do it. It doesn't matter. You know, uh, nobody sees it. Uh, it's just been done in secret. It's just once. Uh, I wouldn't do it again. You know, sometimes once can be a lifetime a mistake you make once can follow you for life something you do only for 10 minutes can chase you for the rest of your life choices do have consequences what you say you will eat it one day what you promise you'll be expected to fulfill who you choose as your friend will determine so much the outcomes of your life. The choice you make in marriage, the choice you make in friendship, the choice you make in your careers, the choice you make as to where you go and where not to go, how to spend your life. All these are choices and every day we have making choices. It is said that we make about 10,000 choices every day. Some of them are simple ones, the choice to brush your teeth or not to brush your teeth has got consequences. To comb your hair or not comb your hair, it's got consequences. Do you know that somebody can simply decide to like you simply because you comb your hair well? Yes. Or somebody can decide not to give you a contract because you didn't brush your teeth. Choices do have consequences. And it has nothing to do with your proposal. It's just that when you started talking, a presence came upon him and he just felt that's it this guy is not serious and cancel the contract now you you have been praying but choices do have consequences whether you wash your clothes or not that's a choice it has consequences your socks whether you wear the same socks for one week it has consequences whether you use deodorant or not it has consequences choices really do have consequences just don't say I'm, I'm just doing it it's just my life it has consequences and some of the consequences may not be what you want so that's my number seven lesson choices really do have consequences so you have to be careful what you do and you have to count the outcome the cost of what you do number eight maturity is a result of quick learning i grow up when i learn from my mistakes Many people have told me, oh, we thought you were older. We thought you were 60. I have 60. What am I doing with 60? Why should I be 60 fast, fast, fast? Don't you know life is one way, journey that the older you go, the closer you are getting to the exit. Why do you want to push me to the exit? <laughs> let, let me enjoy life, please. Maturity is not the same as old age. And maturity doesn't come because you've grown or you've added years. Maturity comes because you learn quickly. And the best way to learn is to learn from your mistakes. So you don't repeat your mistakes. And most of the lessons of my life, I've learned them from mistakes. Some mistakes I made that cost me and I determined never to repeat them. 
when I make mistakes, I don't, I don't defend myself. I accept I've made a mistake, but I determine I never make that mistake again. And it becomes wisdom for me, and it helps me to live my life. Don't be stubborn about your mistake. Don't be arrogant about your mistake. If you are wrong, you are wrong. When you are wrong and you say you are not wrong, you are still wrong. Your verdict doesn't change the wrongness. Wrong is wrong is wrong is wrong. So learn. Learn from it. Learn so that you don't repeat them over and over again. You you get to understand that pretty soon you have so many wisdom ideas about what works and what doesn't work. And it's not because you've lived so for so long. It's simply because you've learned very quickly. You've learned very, very quickly. So it's quick learning. How quickly did you learn? You do this, it doesn't work. You, 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 you share your secret with somebody, he betrays you, but you keep sharing your secret. Huh? Or you, you, you stood for somebody and, and said, oh, this is my best friend. You just met him five minutes. This is my best friend. Then it turns out he's a thief. Why do you then make the next person your best friend again? So you learn that, you know, that's not how to live my life. I have to handle things a little bit differently. And it's as you learn from your mistakes that you mature and you grow beyond your age. Because there are people who have old age who haven't learned anything. They've grown old, but they haven't learned anything. The same mistake they used to make at 10 years, they are making it at 75 years. Same mistake. And some people repeat their mistakes over and over. They always trust the wrong person. But they will come and say, all my friends betray me. You don't need all your friends to be betray you. There's about two. And afterwards choose wisely so you don't always say when i make friends and i commit myself to people then they let me down that means your choosing is wrong there's a process there's a way in which you are choosing or relying on people wrongly be wise let's learn let's learn quickly so that we can grow up number nine ninth lesson i've learned cheap popularity is like cheap jewelry it fades out very quickly. It's like wearing Abyssinia jewelry. <laughs> it's cheap jewelry and it will fade very quickly. Just trying to sell yourself and these days, you know, there's a lot of that marketing yourself, putting yourself in papers, putting yourself in advertisement, making loud noises about you. It's cheap popularity because it's not based on any substance. It's not based on what you've achieved. It's not based on who you are. It's based on what you want people to believe you are. There is no substance. That kind of popularity will fade very quickly. Don't look for cheap popularity. Don't go advertising yourself. Don't scream loud and want everybody to focus on you. And don't always call attention to yourself. One of the things you have to know, that when attention is on you, you become easy target. And when you become easy target, you get shot at. So try not to put too much attention on you. It's better for you to be doing great things when nobody is watching. Nobody gives you a chance. Nobody thinks you can do it. Do it quietly. Do it on the surface. By the time they see it, it's done. And they can't touch it. When Jesus was a baby and he was threatened, God said to the father, take him out to Egypt. Let him hide. Because now he's savior of the world, but he can be killed before his time. But when he hides and protects himself, he will come again. And at that time he can defend himself and he can handle the enemies that are arrayed against him. Don't go for cheap popularity. Don't go singing your praises, bragging about yourself because you make yourself an easy target. And people will target you, want to bring you down, fight you and destroy you when you don't have the strength and the skills to do what you have to do. Cheap popularity is like cheap jewelry. It fades out very quickly. Number 10, my 10th lesson is that life's enduring lessons are learned in silence and inner reflection silence and inner reflection 
I have to learn this, and I think it served me well, to practice silence, quietness, and thinking deeply about my life. And thinking and taking time to think through issues and think through what is going on. Think through why things happen. Think through what is happening to me. Think through my own actions. And find ways of doing things better. Inner reflection, the inner life. Most of us have an outer life. There is nothing inside. Everything is out. There is nothing deep within us. Everything we know, we've said it already. There's nothing we know that we haven't said. Everything, what people see, is what we are. If all that people know about you is who you are, you are very shallow and thin. What people see about you, it should only be a fraction of your real ability. Because your real ability should be deeper than what you are expressing out there. And you build real ability through silence, not through talking. Not through being with friends and being with people all around and, and trying to socialize everywhere and go to every party. But silence. I like silence. I like to be quiet. In the morning, in the evening, even in the day. I like to lie down quietly. And not lie down and sleep, but lie down and not think like worrying. But lie down and think through my own life. Where I've come from. Where I'm going. What mistakes I've made? What limitations I have? Why something I did didn't work? Why I think there should be a better way? I think about my friends. Why some of them have been successful? Why some of them have failed? I think about those who are married. Why some are struggling with their marriages? Why others are seem to be doing well? I do that in silence. It's called inner reflection. It is as you do that, that you learn the most enduring lessons of life. It doesn't come by talking, 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 being everywhere, and even reading, 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 reading. It's good to read, but you have to learn to reflect. You have to learn to digest. You have to learn to apply in your mind what you know to the circumstances around you. Life's enduring lessons come through silence. I want to recommend silence to everybody. Everybody should have a silent hour, a silent moment, a time when you are quiet. I think one of the problems, uh, challenges we have in our country is that there's too much noise. There's very little reflection, very little thinking. People are talking more than thinking. And so if you look at the content of what we say either on radio, what we put in our newspapers, it's all shallow because there's no thinking. We've exhausted all the thinking. And no new thinking is being done. If you think deeply, you will mature older than your age. At the age of 40, you will have the wisdom of an 80-year-old. Because that's how your life should be. You shouldn't be 80 and have the wisdom of a 40-year-old. You should be 40 and have the wisdom of an 80-year-old. So you live life in advance, not in retreat. Life's enduring lessons are learned in silence and inner reflection practice it 11th lesson i've learned is that the pulpit is a sacred trust i must not use it to promote myself i take this seriously when i stand before this box behind it or before it or around it this box called the pulpit which gives me the authority to talk to all of you some of you are wiser than me, older than me, more experienced, better educated, richer, not more handsome, but <laughs> uh, you know, you have experiences I don't have, you know things I don't know, you've been to places I haven't been to, you are doing things I don't have any clue about. I am not the wisest, I'm not the smartest. But when I stand before this pulpit, you listen to me with undivided attention. It's not because I've become great and wise all of a sudden. It simply be, means that God has given me a responsibility. So when I stand here, I don't come and pretend as if I know better than everybody and downplay everybody's intelligence and use it just to promote myself. It's a sacred trust. It's a responsibility God has given to me. It must not 
be used lightly. And that is why I don't really talk much about myself in the pulpit. I don't talk about my achievements. I don't talk about which car I have, where I live, how much my clothes cost, the price of my watch. I don't talk and I would never do that because that is not for the pulpit. If I want to do that, I should go and advertise in a newspaper. Or go, go, go to uh, take an advertising space in PNP newspaper and, and advertise myself. But this pulpit is not for me to show off what I have. It's to be able to come here and be a blessing to you. You have your problems already. You have your struggles already. You, you have things you are dealing with. It's not just for me to come and add up to that and my children are this and my child got this pass and my child got that great in school. I'll never say that. Even if my child is the most intelligent, I'll never say it. The only time I talk about my personal life is when I talk about my difficulties. That's the only thing I share. My difficulties, my struggles, so I can help you to get out of your struggles. But my victories, I keep to myself, my wife and my children. That's all. So the pulpit is a sacred trust. I must not use it to promote myself. And I, I want to encourage every pastor, everybody. It's very easy to abuse the pulpit. Very, very easy. Let's protect the integrity of the pulpit. Number 12. I have to rush. My time is going. I must preach what I believe in and practice what I preach. That's the tough part. Because when you are a preacher, you get to say a lot of things. Some are very nice. Oh, I love my wife. I love my wife. Do you? I make my wife happy. Now, sometimes when you are saying that your wife is frowned her face and looking at you. You make what? <laughs> when your wife thinks you are a hypocrite, you are not worth the pulpit. When your wife doesn't believe in what you are preaching in, you have no business telling anybody else what you are preaching. If your children think you are a liar, you can't use the pulpit. Because if my wife doesn't believe in me, I'm not going to preach again. I'll just take my paintbrush and go and paint. That's true. Because I'm not here just to do showmanship. The people closest to me must know I believe in what I'm doing. That when I say something, it's something I believe in, and I'm practicing or trying to practice and recommending to other people as, as suggesting that people can live their lives by. Preachers are not just to be talkers. They must also be walkers of their talk. We must do what we preach. I must preach what I believe in, not just what I read in a book, and practice what I preach. Number 13. What I know is not all that there is to know. That simply means I don't know it all. I know quite a lot of stuff. But the older I get, the more ignorant I feel. The more ignorant. Every year I feel very ignorant. Because I hear so many things I didn't know. I say, wow, this knowledge is there and I haven't encountered it. I know some things. I don't know it all. That simply means when I preach something today... It's not the final. I may have a refined concept of the same thing and preach it again. When I say something, I'm saying based on where I am at this moment. Not where I'm going to be. Who knows? God will show me new things. I will learn better things. I will be a better person. I have to share what I know. But what I know is not all that there is to know. I cannot close the book on learning. I cannot shut the book to say, oh, I've known it all, this is it, this is what I know, and, and there is nothing more. There is a lot more to learn. Even the Bible. I've read the Bible for God knows how many years. But any time I pick the Bible, I find something new. What I know is not all that there is to know. Even the simple God so loved the world, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he, he gave his only begotten son, and everybody quotes Anytime I read it, I learn something new. Because what you know is not all that there is to know. And that's why we read the Bible year after year. Because we don't know it all. Something you've preached from. You hear another person preach from the same verse. And you say, wow. How come he got it and I didn't get it? Because what you know is not all that there is to know. You are not the final seal to knowledge. 
anybody who is impervious to learning is impervious to development if you don't learn you won't grow if you think what you know is the final and you are the final authority and what you say is the final you will never mature you will just be an ignorant self and you'll be st stuck at where you are what i know is not all that there is to know have you been touched by the message you just heard and you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then say this short prayer. Lord, I admit I am a sinner. I need and want your forgiveness. I accept your death as the penalty for my sin and recognize that your mercy and grace is a gift you offer to me because of your great love, not based on anything I have done. Cleanse me and make me your child. Be faithy receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Savior and Lord of my life. From now on, help me live for you, with you in control. In your precious name, Amen. Congratulations to you. If you have just said that prayer, you are now a child of God. Look around you for a Bible-believing church and also ask Jesus to direct you to the church where you can continue to serve Him. Consider subscribing to this channel too, so that you'll keep learning the realities of God's kingdom. God bless you.